Greetings, everyone. Pavag is back after a, a bit of a break. And this is Jyoti Dodia, and I thank you for joining us today. So last month, um, on the 8th of September, I completed 35 years at IBM. And especially to mark this occasion, IBM announced a new Power 10 server, the E1080. I'm, of course, joking. It was kind of a nice coincidence, though. Um, and yes, Power 10 E1080 has arrived. And I'll point um, resources to, um, uh, to towards the um, Powerbug subscribers uh, in a while. But I'll just take you very briefly through some of the resources that we have available for Power 10. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so these are links to the Power 10 landing page a um, 3D version of the product where you can uh, remove various bits and see things in very much more detail. Um, we've also got, if I move on to the next bit, um, an AR experience um, for following this page. So if you carry on down the arrows, it will take you through different elements of, of the server. Moving on, there's um, some more information about how the system's been put together. And moving on, there's a data sheet. You don't need to worry about taking notes here. I will post um, links to all of these resources later. There is also the Red Book, the Technical Overview and Introduction, which has been recently published. And then here we have the IBM documentation page for the Power 10 server. And there's also resources with the facts and features that you would normally see for um, particular systems, uh, an IDC report, some more videos, and um, also the RAS capabilities, performance reports, uh, um, FLRT and system planning page and also Visio um, templates for the power service that's been updated at the end of September. So, and last but not least, um, Nigel Griffith's YouTube channel um, where he has very many videos, um, some of which are looking at unpacking the system and what it looks like inside as well as some other technical facts so i hope that um, gives you some idea of all the resources that are available for the new server for power 10. so we are on the power bug we are going to take a, a couple of different angles over the next few sessions and that brings me to today's session, which is a hot topic, or, or maybe I should say it's a cool topic. Um, the topic is green is easy with IBM Power. How, how Power 10 contributes to your sustainability journey while saving costs at the same time. I'm really excited to have two top speakers with us, Petra Buer and David Spurway. I will let them introduce themselves in a moment. And you may already have heard them on previous PowerVog sessions or indeed at many of the events they've covered, for example, the Technical University. Oh, and that reminds me, the Technical University is running next week as a virtual event. So that's the 25th to the 28th of October. And we hope many of you have registered already. Um, there is still time to register if you haven't. And there are some lab sessions and places, but those are really limited. So please book your slot sooner rather than later. So now without any further ado, let me hand over to Petra and David. Over to you, Petra. Thank you, Nuti. And uh, yeah, the sharing button came up as well. So let me share my screen. Can you see my title slide? Yes, I can. All right, let me add my browser as well. So the video plays well. Can you see um, my browser now? Yes, I can. All right, great, perfect. 
So thanks for the introduction, Yoti, and maybe let's start with a brief introduction of, of myself and, and David, for those of you who don't know us. Um, so I'm Petra Gura, as, as Yoti mentioned. Um, I'm from the Worldwide Sales Team, but before joining that team, uh, one and a half years ago, I was part of the offering management team on, on Power, so I hope I, I bring some experience there. And just to add to the sustainability topic, uh, I mean, Yoti, you had it in the description, but I wanted to call this out again. I mean, the sustainability topic or better said, the responsible uh, computing umbrella, uh, even as a broader topic, is, is a very important topic to me. Uh, and it's, it's definitely one of the reasons why why I work at and, and for IBM, because we create uh, technology for the better, I would say. Uh, and I believe every one of us, every enterprise can make a difference. Uh, so this is why this topic is close to me. And, and I'm really glad that we made major improvements. Uh, I mean, we were always good on the IBM Power side already, and we will talk about that, but in particular with Power 10. Uh, and with that, uh, David, over to you for a short introduction. Oh, and I'm working out of Germany because we just talked about where everyone is dialing in from. And hello there. Yes, I, I'm David Sperry. I'm a systems technology architect uh, with a reasonable number of years of experience in IBM Power Systems. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today. All right, perfect. So I thought to start with a very short video. Don't worry, it's it's one minute. But I thought this video really outlines very well uh, how IBM thinks to the topic. And as you can see, we have a whole website around good tech IBM. Uh, so I'll play it briefly and, and just be quiet for that minute. My goal is to become an astronaut. And I don't know what happened here. I refreshed the browser and the wrong video. Yeah, that, that looks so, different. That's different. <laughs> like, what is this? So I really do apologize for that. Um, so maybe let me fix that uh, later and, and, and just get started. I mean, what you would have seen, and I do apologize for that, is basically some of the goals that IBM set, like um, going to um, zero uh, in terms of carbon footprint and emission at 2030. Uh, it talks about some of the other goals that I will touch on shortly. So again, I do apologize. I hope in the end I, I will be able to play it again and see what happened there. Um, one thing I wanted to point out as well is that, I mean, this is not a new topic to IBM and th these high level chart I kept to minimum, but I thought it is very important to understand the bigger sustainability and responsible computing story. But this year actually marks the 50th anniversary of IBM's first envir environmental policy um, that you can see on the right. And even two years prior to that, jo uh, Thomas J. Watson Jr. was talking about our corporate responsibility, who later put this, this first uh, policy in place. So as you can see, uh, we have a very long history there. What I did here as well, and this is not all to be read, but more a reference chart is, these are all snippets out of this year's IBM environmental report. So it's called uh, the um, 2020 report because it's for numbers and data uh, for, for the whole year 2020. And basically it talks to the commitments to drive progress with uh, 21 voluntary goals uh, for environmental sustainability. And you can see the major areas uh, on this chart here. And one metric that is obviously in everyone's mind these days is, is CO2 emission, often referred to as carbon footprint. Uh, that's why I put it at the top here. And um, one comment I wanted to make is that some companies are just starting to report their CO2 emission. IBM has actually voluntarily reported on CO2 emission for over 27 years already. Um, so, so I think that shows that this is an important and always was an important topic um, for us at IBM. So when we talk about environmental um, 
responsibility. I mean, obviously there are a lot of things we can do that enterprises can do. And one thing I wanted to point out that, um, well, now we looked at IBM, now let's look at IBM systems that both David and I are, are part of and the solutions we are building. Uh, we have continued to, to develop products at, at the leading edge of innovation, I would say, but at the same time, the guiding principles to develop, manufacture, and market them in an environmentally conscious manner are, are the same. So we make sure to be increasingly energy efficient, to incorporate recycled content and environmentally preferable materials, uh, to make sure products and piece parts can be upgraded, refurbished, remanufactured, and reused to extend um, the product's life. And finally, make sure that they can be dismantled, recycled, and dis disposed of safely. And we'll get into the details uh, for all of these areas. So when we now look at IBM Power and in a bit at Power 10 in particular, um, we have a long history there as well um, when it comes to outstanding performance and energy efficiency. So over 30 years, starting with Power 1 in 1990, maybe even before that, and like previous generations, um, Power 10 will further improve in terms of performance and scale, and in particular doing that in an efficient way. Um, built on our leading edge 7 nanometer chip technology, which, which obviously helps, uh, but it's not just the chip by itself, right? It's the, it's the overall solution, the complete stack, but of course it all starts at the bottom of the architecture, which, which is um, the chip. So just a little excursion here, and that will be quick to show you that power 10 and 7 nanometers is not the end. Um, IBM research had um, achieved this and put out a blog. I mean, I, I believe we have it in the IBM newsroom uh, with their seven nanometer chip technology. And what you can see here is uh, that, I mean, that promise is really uh, slashing the carbon footprint of, of data centers. So as mentioned, if you want to read more about it, you can go here, but I think this is really impressive in particular looking at some of the competition uh, struggling with the seven nanometers we were able to achieve, achieve with, with Power 10. So, Yuti, thank you very much for um, talking a little bit to, yeah, we introduced Power 10 and the material. Uh, in the end of the slide deck, in this backup section, we actually have a slide with links uh, to almost everything you showed. I should add one or two links that you showed that I don't have on my list yet. Um, and probably most of you have seen this chart. It was used, I believe, in the launch event in a lot of official material. Um, and it talks to the key value points of, of Power 10, that it, it was really engineered for agility, for the hybrid cloud era, um, with the capabilities uh, to really allow customers um, to respond faster to, to ever-changing business needs, to protect data, not only in your data center, but from there to the cloud, to streamline business um, insights and automation, and obviously doing that um, while maximizing availability and reliability. And looking at this chart, I mean, if you have a closer look at this respond faster box, it talks about efficient scaling. But to me, these two words do not do the justice to what was done in terms of sustainability. So my version of this chart looks like this because Power 10 and the sustainability compute theme uh, really allows to do more with less. And when I say more with less, uh, it comes down to material that's being used, it comes down to energy um, that is being consumed. And obviously, if you can reduce all that and do more work with the same amount um, uh, with, with less infrastructure, you can save on data center space as well, and thus cost in the end as well. So just wanted to make sure that this is a very important topic um, but a little bit hidden here behind efficient scaling. 
So when looking at sustainability in now uh, and in a bit, we'll get deeper into carbon footprint. How, how can you calculate it? How do you know what infrastructure is, is uh, more sustainable than another? So I just put down some sustainability considerations. So first of all, of course, are you buying from a responsible computing provider? And probably I should have put or working with because what I see recently is it gets more and more important um, in it, within a, any enterprise a, across the world. And it really leads um, to business decisions being made on this topic, be it like deciding where to put a factory because um, there is greener energy consumption being, being possible, uh, be it working with different logistic companies that have a better um, CO2 emission sheet, I call it, uh, and, and much more. And of course, some of the countries uh, came up with, with regulations, with mandates. So a lot of enterprises really have a lot of pressure achieving their sustainability targets and otherwise have to pay not only two digit, but three digit million dollar um, fees if they don't meet these targets. Um, so I see this increasing for the last 18 months in particular, but I bet this is um, escalating more and more and, and everyone needs to pay attention and see what they can do. Um, of course, it's as well important to run on current infrastructure because, of course, the latest, greatest technology is, is in most cases, more energy efficient, for instance, and has a better material uh, from an in, uh, environmental uh, perspective um, than older infrastructure. Then, obviously, it's important that you run on performance and scalable infrastructure because if you can do more work, um, on on the same server needing less servers that's obviously more more sustainable and then the last two here where we are in particular strong is if you can consolidate different type of workloads on the same server and then can run it up to very high utilizations that is of course much more sustainable than having a certain server for a certain workload and kind of low utilized um, and a different one for the other workload. Um, I, I guess you, you get the idea. And with that, um, I hand over uh, to David to talk a little bit about what's going on in the cloud and in the internet. Yes, thank you, Petra. And if you could advance that. And so I will start actually by talking about a little bit of what's happening in Glasgow. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the strange image that is turning up here on the slide on the right. Uh, this is one of the, scene, the scenes that you can see in Glasgow. Is there is there's a statue in Glasgow, the centre of Glasgow, that always has at least one cone on his head. Uh, it turns out that he's actually the Duke of Wellington, but most Glaswegians don't know him as Duke of Wellington. They know him as the man with a cone on his head. Uh, but actually, there's more going on in Glasgow than just strange cones on people's heads. Uh, if you can cl click the button, if you don't mind. We also have just in the, uh, just a few weeks time now, uh, the UN Climate Change Conference uh, is happening in Glasgow uh, in, con in partnership with Italy, uh, but uh, all sorts of world leaders are gonna be descending on Glasgow, uh, hopefully using relatively sustainable transport to get here, because uh, they're actually looking at what we can do about sustainability at the worldwide level. And uh, they're gonna be talking about it here in Glasgow and may or may not be seeing a man with the cone in his head at the same time. Uh, if you can click onto the next slide, if you don't mind. Other strange images that you might not be expecting include this particular picture here. This actually represents one of the points I had when I started getting really interested in this topic area. Uh, Rashik Parma, who you may know, uh, that he is uh, an IBM fellow inside of IBM, uh, came and uh, presented to us in one of these things called physical face-to-face -face meetings. Do you remember such things? Uh, we had uh, lots of us in the same room when we weren't even wearing masks, uh, where he would stand up in front of us and was talking about things that were in the media at the time including this, this particular uh, piece that was actually there out there on the BBC at the po uh, point. Uh, Dirty Streaming, the Internet's Big Secret. Uh, that was a, a piece of work done by Beth Webb uh, for the BBC here in the UK, and she went in search of the Internet and discovered that the cloud is actually a vast network of energy-guzzling data centres and undersea cables. 
tables. I strongly suspect my audience here kind of already knows what the cloud is uh, and might recognize one or two slight challenges with, with uh, feeling that it's, it's a, a vast network of energy guzzing data centers. But in reality, of course, some of that was rather good and some of it wasn't quite so good. If you could advance the next slide. There was a piece of, of work done again in the UK, partially debunking that particular BBC article uh, just a little bit, uh, but um, that, that, that there were uh, some important tenets that were absolutely valid in what they were actually saying in the in the, in the article. Uh, what the, the actual details were, maybe not 100% accurate. And so what I'm going to try and do for part of this presentation is try to get to some of those rather more measured and, and accurate details. But round about 1% of the energy usage uh, by businesses is through the data centers that they use and so there is an, an element because uh, one percent might not sound very big but it's actually a, a measure of a, a very large number and something that therefore is important to be able to actually have a look at and see what we can do about it so customers all over the world are looking at what they can do to be able to lower their energy usage and as we know many customers uh, may be looking to the clouds to be able to consider that uh, as possible places to be and they don't have to be quite as bad as the bpc article might have been suggesting so if you can do a click to the next page if that's all right uh, so what I'm showing here is how Amazon, uh, Amazon have a, a white paper, a document written up here, which talks about how they look to yes, they maximize the usage, the, the current servers and highly utilization, how their carbon reduction opportunity of moving to Amazon Web Services. And if I can ask you to click again, then this is a kind of small version. And so if I can ask you to click one more time, it should zoom out. There we are. And so this is part of that paper. And that's part of the paper from Amazon Web Services talking about how they lower their carbon emissions. Uh, I certainly started this expecting the, the large part to be how clever their data centers are. Being cloud providers, they can, of course, invest heavily in data centers. But it turns out that's a very small part of actually how they do their energy usage. 11% uh, is through carbon Reduction for more efficient data centers. 17% is carbon reduction about attributable to reduced electricity consumption and renewable energy usage. But the vast majority, 61%, is all about using more efficient servers and higher server utilization, which certainly got me thinking uh, in that actually, when it comes to a more efficient utilization of servers and high levels utilization, we can do better than that any time, any day. So I had a look at what Azure was then going to say. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on again. So this is what Azure says, and, and that, that's maybe a little small, but what uh, I found quite amusing was that even to be able to open the document, they have system requirements, Windows 10, to be able to open the document, which I, I found quite, quite amusing. Uh, inside of this document, talking about how they do carbon benefits of cloud computing, they have a couple of different uh, slides, one of which is here. So they measure energy usage per core per hour, which I found an interesting measure to, to focus on the per core in the first place. And they're talking about physical servers with localized Deployment. If you then virtualize those servers, you can indeed get better energy utilization. And they're suggesting that in, in Azure, they can do better than those in enterprise data centers. I'm not really quite so sure, but uh, that's what their, their documents talk about. And I think maybe we've got a, a position to be able to, in some ways, argue that. So if you could go to the next page, if that's all right. In that, well, again, from that Azure document, they talk about driving up computational load from around 10% up to around 40%. And while, of course, that's a factor of four increase and you don't use much more power for the servers in driving up that level of utilization, we can do so much better than that. Since the Power 8 days, we've had guaranteed levels of utilization. And again, you have to be a little careful how you use these utilization guarantees. We guarantee our servers to be fully capable of operating and, and delivering service at high levels of utilization. And of course, we actually have you, our customers, running at these high levels of utilization day in, day out by putting lots and lots of workloads together, using virtualization, and therefore driving up the levels of utilization across the board. So it got me thinking about the individual building blocks people are actually using, and the clouds have to be able to be used. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on again. 
Thank you very much. So what I do here is I had a look at the uh, so the innards, the actual servers used by Azure uh, and also AWS. Uh, but this picture here is talking about the Azure ones. The Azure building blocks are actually servers that are are, are fairly standard commodity. And the, so in this case, these servers are actually ones I can look up using an independent view of their performance. So one of the things we have access to in IBM is we work through IDC. And IDC have this QPI, the Qualified Performance Index, to be able to give you a different measure of performance, an independent measure of performance for these different systems. And you can see here that I've got the building blocks from Azure. And then below that, I have a, a couple of examples of the E1080. Uh, the E1080 massive 240 core we know is coming, uh, that it, it'll be generally available in that scale soon. Uh, and of course, you can already get uh, the 96 core. And you can see that the 96 cores does vastly more work uh, than actually the amount of uh, the amount of uh, performance that is possible with the, the, the building blocks from, from uh, Azure. Also, I just mentioned there that there are four different measures that, that, that IDC look to, the second of which is power. And so when I looked at what the power utilization for these building blocks, it's not my own IBM point of view that I'm using. It's actually an independent uh, IDC version of what the power utilization is for those servers. If you wouldn't mind advancing again. So this looks at how, what the QPI numbers are uh, for each one of these individual systems uh, as, a, as a server total, uh, as a whole, for their QPI kind of numbers. So far left, you've got a couple of examples from uh, AWS, uh, one of which is, is a fairly large server that's virtualized, and uh, the other is the same server, but actually used in a bare metal sense, uh, and so as, as, as large as it gets. Then I've got a couple of examples from Azure. Uh, so Azure, I've got a couple of systems there, uh, you're using a couple of different types of processes processors, including the EPIC processor, and then I move forward to the 950 and my two E1080s. And so if you can click again, if you don't mind, Petra, what this chart here is showing is what the performance per core, not just for the server, but actually for the processor cores. And so our Power 9 ones were good, our Power 10 ones are even better, and vastly outstrip the capabilities of those cloud instances on a per core basis. So we can do better per core, uh, but of course, actually what they were saying was they wanted to be able to drive up levels of utilization, because that's where the energy usage actually matters, and it's a fair point of view. So if you wouldn't mind advancing the slides again, so this is what actually happens when I take some of the biggest E1080s, the newest E1080 systems, and put them alongside and run 250 different workloads through these different systems through a total cost of ownership model that I've been using for many years. And so what you've got in the kind of uh, bars in the middle here, that the reds and greens, those are different levels of utilization. And I don't suggest that these building blocks in the clouds can't run at high levels of utilization, but they just don't have the capability, the scalability that we have for the E1080. So they just can't run as many workloads as we can on our big E1080. And the far right hand side, the one I've circled in blue, you can see that the peak utilization and the average utilization are much, much closer together. I've got 47% average, 66% uh, peak for my big, huge E1080 with 240 cores, when all the building blocks that are in the clouds just can't get close to that. They can run at high levels of peak, but the average utilization, because they're just not that large, can't hold that many workloads until they don't drive them up. And so we can make more efficient usage of our servers and drive higher levels of utilization because we can just scale to be much bigger. If we can advance forward a little bit, Petra had mentioned some of this earlier, but uh, in some cases, after all, I too tend to agree with Intel. And so Intel back in 2018, we're talking about the fact that you do need to consider these two different factors. You need to consider per core performance, and you also need to consider throughput performance. So throughput was what I was just looking at of the, the scale of our servers, and per core, of course, comes to, into its own when we look to the actual software that's charged per core. So that was what they said in 2018, and then they were aiming for seven nanometers. So if we can advance the next slide. Uh, by 2019, they were still aiming. So there's a couple of clicks here, if you wouldn't mind. So first of all, the click goes to the, the 10 nanometer that we have in 2019, and then next it showed they were aiming for seven nanometers back in 2019, and they had a plan to be able to have that launch in 2021. That's where we were then. Again, if you could click on from here. This takes us to 2020, and so again, we still have things that aren't quite there. So we have, uh, with the first click, we have the Cooper Lake processors being talked about that were then coming out, and with the next click, they were talking about Ice Lake, which was still actually to come at that point. Uh, and then finally, to the next slide about where we are now as we march through different timescales up to 2021, they finally have actually 
um, to the new Ice Lake processors, uh, which bring a little bit more performance, but they don't have the scalability. They can only scale to one or two socket systems and don't have the scalability that we have within power. So again, on the per core performance, they have been able to deliver some more, but it actually takes more energy to do so. So if you can advance one more click, then this is a kind of little tiny graph that grows in a second, but this is a piece of work that was done by the next platform, writing up a lot of detail around these individual processor points. And so if you can zoom out that, that graph a little bit to make it a bit easier to read, thank you. Uh, and then if we click on one more, then they have managed over a significant number of years from back in the Halem days, which some of us might remember, uh, have managed about 2.35 times per an increase per core. And of course, we've done much, much bigger than that uh, with the power processors. They also have that to be able to get that kind of increase per core. It now it doesn't take less energy, it takes more energy. So there's more power going into these things. So the fact, where they, the fact that the clouds have still got these isolate processors as previews, it's not going to improve their situation for energy utilization and sustainability, it's going to go the other way. And why is this? If we, if we click onto the next page, this is because Intel have a very different focus from, from, from us. Uh, so you can see they do have server CPU as a little thin blue bar on the left hand side there. And they have an awful lot of other areas where they're looking to be able to expand, including other things in data centers and networks and Internet of Things and PCs and those sorts of elements. Whereas what we care about are the actual enterprise grade server processors. And that's why actually we don't necessarily have uh, the same level of competition these days from Intel. So one more page if you could. That brings us to a collaboration between IBM and Intel. So actually they can recognize that we're able to come up with some of these advancements, uh, which also lower the amount of energy used uh, with the number pro with the process we work with in a different way to how they've been working. And so we're now partnering with Intel, showing the relevance of IBM power systems in the marketplace because they need to work with us to be able to do that. And so I think Petra, maybe is at this point do I pass back to yourself? Exactly. Thank you so much. So this is a, a chart we we looked at earlier before I handed over to you, David, right? To talk a little bit about our competition, the the internet and, and clouds. So now let's let's have a closer look at at, at Power Ten. Um, Petra, just before yeah. you go ahead, I just wanted to um, remind our participants that if, you, if they have any questions, please put them into the chat window and we'll take those as we go along. Good Thank point. You. Yeah, good point. And maybe there will be some opportunities for questions in the, in the upcoming material. Now we dive, dive deeper into the topic. So, I mean, first of all, um, David talked a little bit about the competition. We will do that more, but of course, a lot of people are interested in the generational uh, statements, so to speak. So what's in them if they come from older power generations like power eight or power nine. So, I mean, this chart basically shows um, how much more energy efficient um, we are. And on the left side, the 52% that you can see means that if you come from a comparable power eight system, so the E880C in this case, and move to the 1080, um, basically you have 52% lower energy consumption, which means you basically can do twice the work with your system in case you expect growth, or you can cut your infrastructure in half while running the same workload, which is, um, I think, a great statement. And even when uh, coming from a 980, the N-1 version, so to speak, um, you can you can run at 33% uh, lower energy consumption. And, and to my point earlier, if you can do the same work with less infrastructure, of course, you need you can reduce your, your energy consumption, thus end up with a smaller carbon footprint. And as a side effect, you can uh, save data center foot, um, space as well as uh, costs, uh, which of course is, is, is very beneficial as well. And talking about cost, I mean, if you can do the same work with half of the infrastructure, with half the amount of cores, that obviously allows you as well uh, to cut your software licensing and, and maintenance quite significantly. Um, as we heard from David, it has as well an impact how you deploy. And I mean, we have been always be strong in terms of consolidating utilization, um, running workloads across, across your private cloud uh, to take best advantage of the infrastructure we have in place. 
But one thing that we introduced a couple of years ago is this Power Pride Cloud with dynamic capacity, which basically provides a more flexible um, financial model for our customers so they can take even better advantage of the infrastructure they have in place because it allows basically to share resources across systems and use whatever you need besides the planned uh, capacity, uh, just use it and be metered by the minute. And that causes that customers can save 20 to 30% on, on their permanent activations that they usually would put on each of the individual system in terms of headroom. So, I mean, this is a great, um, great offering by itself. And who is interested in the detail, we recently had a, 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 had a, had a webinar that's available on demand on this, but this model allows um, for more sustainability too, because for instance, uh, one of the systems could be safe because the three others basically um, could, could share resource in, in a more sustainable way. Now let's get a little bit into the details. And I, I don't know, I guess it started 10 months ago or so where I started to receive all these questions from customers directly or from our sales teams in terms of what about the carbon footprint? How does this look like? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this and share one specific customer example here. That customer um, is running uh, Oracle workloads. And this was actually a deal um, well, um, probably one to two years ago. So that was with the E980s. Um, so what we did is we, we created the logic here, right? Looking at how many Intel systems we were able to replace by just two 980 systems. Um, taking into account all we talked about, the better per core performance to, to, to David's point and the throughput, um, our outstanding consolidation capabilities and in particular higher utilizations because they had more than 100 Intel systems. I mean, there were Exadata, ODAs, um, other Intel servers um, running at relatively low utilization. And due to our capabilities there, we could just replace all of them with two 980s. And based on the RPERFs for the 1080, we basically extrapolated this. Um, and as that was Exadata X8, which is a little bit older, we worked in uh, a newer generation of Intel servers with the Xeon pro, uh, uh, Gold processors. So here you can basically see uh, energy consumed in, in kilowatt hours and how that translates from Exadata, the Intel systems, Power 8, Power 9, and now Power 10 high-end systems. And of course, if that's the energy consumed and you basically put it the other way around, you basically can reduce your carbon footprint uh, with the following percentages. If you start from the exudator and compare it to the Intel systems, that 35% less uh, with power eight, 75, 85 on power nine and 92% on power eight. So that's all fine. And this is a specific example, but what a lot of customers ask for um, what is the actual carbon footprint? So not the percentage, not the reduction, but what is the carbon footprint? And I can tell you this is not a trivial answer. So I wanted to explain a little bit um, how this all works. And I can highly recommend this electricity map um, that I played around with this morning again to have some current numbers that allows you to see how much uh, CO2 is emitted to produce your electricity in a particular country. It as well um, shows where your electricity comes from because one aspect is how you produce it, but then is to whom do you, um, I, I mean, where do you export and import energy and what does this do to your energy mix? mix? And then of course, there are all kinds of conditions that influence that such as wind and solar conditions. So what I did here is this is kind of um, a snippet out of, of Europe. 
And this shows basically uh, the consumption map, which takes into account the import export to, to other countries. Uh, if we switch to the production view, that just takes into account um, how it's being produced and ignores the export import. And I just took, because David is uh, in, in the UK, I took uh, Great Britain here. So you can see what the carbon uh, intensity, they call it, was this morning for Britain. And you can see exactly what was the energy mix um, and how dirty or green it was, basically, that led to the 126 grams. And it shows you as well, well, how did that intensity change over the last 24 hours? And what was actually the energy mix uh, during the, the last 24 hours? And what you can see here, and I mean, David mentioned this to me a while ago, right? There's a, a little area uh, up in the north there that's very green that basically um, exports um, electricity uh, to the to the bigger part of Great Britain, which that way um, gets gets greener. And I did the same for Germany. Just to very do very windy up there. There are no trees. It's just very windy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should have mentioned that. Good point. It, it's it's very windy there. So a lot of wind energy, which is very green. And then if you look at Germany here as well, you can see the energy mix, how it used to be this morning, intensity, how it changed during the last several hours. And what you can see here, we export energy like to Poland and Czech, who has a lot of coal, and that's why they are very dirty. So by us exporting it there, they get to a better balance sheet and we import um, electricity from France, which makes us greener at the same time. So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. So if you want to calculate the carbon footprint, it's heavily dependent where you do that, in what country, and how is uh, the energy sourced um, on that particular day, so to speak. Um, I, of course, did it as well for other parts of the world. For some of them, obviously, there's uh, there's no data. So, like, uh, in the US, I took California to just show you, like, here during the day, they have a lot of sun, so they have a lot of solar energy, which is the orange here. So, the uh, carbon intensity is much better during the day the hard time because they can get greener energy. Then I did one for APEC. Um, which is India here as well, not a lot of data, but what I found interesting is that, well, it's it's completely stable, right? So um, natural gas and uh, there's no really fluctuations there. And then I did the same uh, for, for Japan, how the mix is, how the mix is there, how it changed over the last 24 hours. So as you can see, it's very dynamic. So in order, to compare, obviously, you need average values that are actually being created um, for four years, obviously. And what you can see here, these are the values uh, that have been basically uh, finally um, found out. And as you can see, it's 2018, 18, 2019, because for several of these countries, they did not even finalized the calculations for 2020 yet. So I guess that gives you an idea how complex it is. So I took these, um, these um, carbon factors, so to speak, that you can find in this document for the five um, countries we just looked at and just multiplied it with the example we looked at earlier in terms of carbon or energy um, reduction and carbon footprint reduction, and in what actual um, uh, carbon footprint that translates into. So as we saw, I mean, UK look, look the best. Uh, so in this example, it's, it, it, and here again, Exadata, the internal systems, power eight, power nine, power 10. And I did this for all the other countries. And there you can see it's the, the same example across all of them but very different carbon uh, uh, factors based on how the energy is sourced. So if you want to play around with it, I put all the links here uh, where you can basically for your own country get the carbon footprint and, and play around with it a bit. 
But as you can see, it's not like if someone asks you, what is the carbon footprint? Uh, you have to ask a lot of questions. So now we talked about power 10 in our high end systems for quite a bit. Um, but I did not want to miss touching on our mid range and scale out portfolio uh, running power nine at the moment and for several more months. Um, and there's where we have a great story, I think. So during last year, um, these product portfolios were certified with the Energy Star, um, awarding our energy efficiency that did improve by 30 to 60 uh, percent compared to its, its predecessor generation. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up here, I mean, Energy Star, they look only at a certain um, portfolio of systems. So, um, like the high end systems we have, or like the Z systems that are in place, are not really um, in scope for having a look at with the Energy Star. Um, and so far, I did not get a lot of questions there. What I got a lot of questions on is actually PCF. So, a couple of months ago, this acronym started to, to be thrown at me um, quite a bit. And this PCF stands for product carbon footprint. And it's basically the most established method for determining uh, the climate impact of, of a product. Um, when I started researching this, I, I quickly found another acronym, which is PAIA, which stands for Product Attribute Impact Assessment, which is actually a project that was started by the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and their material systems lab and is an industry-led research initiative that simplifies that difficult task that we talked about of, of conducting um, another acronym, LCA, uh, which is a life cycle analysis. Um, these PAI tools and methodology is um, primarily being used for, for greenhouse gases, uh, gases uh, but it's not restricted to it. And broadly speaking, the objective is to develop information on the carbon impact of products based on their component parts. And we actually joined this PAIA uh, consortium in, in August, which means we now have access to that simplified methodology and the calculation tools to calculate a product carbon footprint of a certain product. And as you might imagine, I mean, IBM has hundreds, thousands of products. So that will take a while uh, until we get in there. And to my point earlier, I mean, there's some complexity in there for in terms of what country you calculate this for. Uh, that's one. And the other one, it is specific to a certain configuration, right? And, and you, I guess you all know we have quite a little bit of flexibility <coughs> here. So the carbon footprint is always calculated for a product incorporating all of its, its piece parts. But what I try to do, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful <laughs> for that that, that um, worked out, I did uh, prioritize the E1080 to be one of the first products um, being fed into this tool so we can calculate the product carbon footprint. Um, it's not published yet, uh, but we are almost there. And what you can see here, it will be for a specific configuration and it will be for a certain country or geography. Um, but for those of you who were waiting for this, we are about to publish uh, the product carbon footprint for the new uh, Power E1080. And with that, I guess I hand back to you, David. Yeah, so we, we talked about the E1080 after all. We talked about the kind of different scales. We talked about how the clouds are doing. 
period. And so this is the kind of thing that really comes out in the end of the model uh, when I look at what these different kind of numbers are. Uh, looking at energy, uh, so as I say, I was able to use uh, the independent view of the energy. I was in, able to use independent view of the performance to be able to see what, what comes out. And of course, running it through the model, I can work out how many servers are needed to run a given number of workloads. And that, of course, ha has an energy footprint to it. So looking on the left hand side, the, the AMS web services instances, uh, they needed quite a few, and about 21 of their individual instances to be able to handle the workloads that I could fit easily inside one of the biggest E1080s. And that meant that you got a lot of servers, uh, and although they are level, looking to uh, drive high levels of utilization, they weren't as high as we could achieve, and therefore actually the E1080 was around about 67% lower on energy usage than those systems. The Azure system here, uh, that's in the kind of middle here, uh, the, the D64, uh, it was also not managing to run as many workloads and not, not managing to achieve the same level of, of utilization, and therefore it used 33% more energy. Uh, in fairness, uh, not all models show that I win every time, uh, but the, the Azure systems were just 5% less energy, were 5% 5 lower energy than my E1080 uh, in the kind of best case scenario where they use the biggest of their boxes, D96s, uh, with the new systems from Epic to be able to achieve very much comparable energy levels. Uh, but comparable, after all, is not necessarily the entire end of the story. We're focusing on sustainability and energy usage today, but money is still important. So if you can go on to the next slide. We can be best in class with energy and at the same time, be five times less expensive, depending on the software we're talking about, but five times less expensive compared to things like Cloud Pack for Data running on some of those cloud instances. So yes, the D96 might have come out as maybe around the same energy usage, maybe just fractionally better with 5% lower. It's an awful lot more expensive when you start adding the software on top as well. Uh, so these different elements can be considered in the round, as, as I believe that the saying goes. Uh, so, yeah, just wanted to make sure that those those results were, were, were explained, uh, and then I think I might be passing straight back to you again, Petra. Not sure. I thought you wanted to cover that, but I... <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So I, I have the pleasure of being part of uh, an IBM Academy of Technology uh, initiative, which is referred to as responsible computing. Uh, and I've been talking about infrastructure there. I've been, I, therefore, I have a kind of owning a piece of the responsible computing infrastructure element uh, that looks at those pieces, which is why I have I've run up those numbers, looking at the cloud and seeing what makes sense. Uh, there are other elements to that as well. Uh, so uh, there are other pieces, and we'll talk a little bit about them in, in coming slides time, but uh, other elements to the sustainability message include how your code actually runs in these systems as well. Uh, so most, as you're aware, mo uh, most IBM customers, most customers running AIX or IBM I, uh, they don't need to patch their systems very often, and they maybe apply patches maybe one or two times a year. Uh, PowerVM, AIX, and IBM I all have orders of magnitude fewer security exposures uh, than alternatives uh, such as Windows and Linux. Uh, so again, you need to install far, far fewer patches. What has this got to do with sustainability? Uh, well, if you wouldn't mind clicking Petra, then if we reduce the patch cycles, uh, then you can actually stay current and you, it reduces the cost of patching. The cost being, after all, that you have to actually uh, put work, put uh, energy usage into, into, the, into the servers to be able to process the, those patches, to pull, pull them down off the internet, to apply them to the systems, to apply the patches. That actually does take computational work. Uh, and there's also the risk of uh, system outages. Uh, and of course, that we can actually vastly lower the number of those outages and the lower the usage as well. Uh, what we're kind of talking to is responsible code. Our code doesn't need to be going, going around in loops very often. And so our code, after all, is also more responsible than alternatives that you can see out there because we have to apply far fewer patches. Yeah, and David, to, uh, just to add to that, right? One is applying the patches and a lot of customers actually run some regression or whatnot after the patches, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just applying the patches, uh, but kind of follow on load on the system too, that you could save on just having way, way fewer patches that you need to take care of. Yeah. Entirely fair. Absolutely. And therefore, uh -huh. computational work. Computational work that's needed, etc., and uh, we can look to that. Um, 
I also, Petra did a session for us when we were actually going through the, the Power 10 launch, and part of what she was talking about was sustainability and has uncovered more, more interesting pieces. So, of course, uh, as we do go around, for example, we've been suggesting that a good method of moving forward could be that you upgrade your existing infrastructure. Uh, and power is one, but other infrastructure you can upgrade as well. Uh, IBM's GARS, the Global Asset Recovery Service, is one piece that can actually help with that and can remarket pre-owned systems and be able to buy them for you if you want. Wanted to. And so if we click on from there, and some of these statistics that are coming out from what we do with that after reuse and <laughs> just, just a second, David. I'm going to mute everyone and unmute you. That sounds sure. great. I want some power to suggest that you. Yeah. And okay, David, you should be good to go. I think I am. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Petra, I think you're about to say. No, I just was about to say that. I mean, these statistics actually are coming out of this uh, environmental report I talked uh, about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and I've actually just shared them with some of my storage colleagues in that this, this isn't precise to power. This is actually IBM in general and managing to achieve more than 96% by weight being recycled and resold, which is great. 3% uh, was sent to, to waste of energy. But, and I think it is, I was very impressed and surprised from, to be to be frank, uh, that we can achieve less than 1% being sent to landfill or incineration, considering the, the, the components we're talking about. But that uh, uh, I wouldn't have assumed that we could get to that level, low level of landfill or incineration for, for computational resources, uh, but it seems that we actually can, and we've been putting a lot of work over the years into doing so. Uh, if you could step forward. So the other things that we've also been changing is we've also been looking into how we actually are more sustainable with how we actually uh, ship out uh, servers for, from IBM, how we ship out our, our infrastructure into to our customers. So we've reduced the weight of the pallet by about 25% uh, while st still keeping it strong enough to do what it needs to do. And of course, they need to be very strong because some of our components are really quite heavy. Uh, and that's uh, amounted to round, round about 250 million tonnes of wood per year with a corresponding saving of about a million dollars in transport costs and associated environmental burden. Uh, the picture here actually is a uh, delivery oh, to one of David, Sorry to interrupt. It's actually 250 <laughs> metric tons, which is yeah. 226 tons, roughly, yeah, that we were able to say. Yeah. Thank you. Apologies. Yeah, there's an awful lot of wood I was suggesting otherwise. Uh, but, uh, the, the, this is this is actually a delivery to one of our customers. Uh, this is one of our larger. So when you have this many pallets arriving at customers, it does make a fairly significant impact. And so we've been able to uh, to fine tune what goes into that. Uh, and if you could click Petra, if you don't mind. And of course, we've also been able to make changes inside of our systems as well. So we use new post-consumer recycled resins that eliminate the use of more than 5,000 pounds of petroleum-based materials inside of our actual systems going forward. Uh, Emily, I've missed off that, Petra? No, no, you, you said it well. And I mean, you mentioned right at eight for, for the upper part, uh, 250 metric tons of wood were saved. And I mean, the 25, uh, percent um, weight reduction is important too because you need to ship less weight which means less fuel less gas less whatever that needs to be um, yeah used to get the systems where they should finally end up to so I, I think there are a lot of benefits in here and one thing we didn't touch on and we should have probably mentioned that this was actually an innovation that IBM Systems re uh, received the IBM's chairman um, and remind an environmental uh, award uh, 2021, so in July, uh, and the link to that one is in the backup section of the deck as well. But yeah, there's a lot going on in, in that space, and as you can see, this is more generic. I mean, most of it here is for power. Um, but there's a lot of effort underway to get this more down to a particular product level, like, okay, how does that translate in terms of if we talk about uh, a power E1080, for instance, rather than talking power or systems overall? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, as you said, it is, it is more generic. It's wider than that. And so if we can move on to the next slide. 
I've talked about the fact that I'm part of this initiative, that this is actually round two of an academy technology initiative for responsible computing. And responsible computing is about uh, restoring trust in IT. I talked early on about the kind of elements in the media talking about dirty secret of the internet and whether IT actually is, is can be a force for good or, or is seen as a, a force for bad, if you will, if, if we're as simple as that. Uh, and we know that we can. We can be uh, responsible for shaping ways to restore trust in IT by responsible developing and applying technology and by sharing our experience with others and sharing the experience is exactly what's going on right now in this round of the responsible computing initiative uh, so it's not just about the infrastructure there are other pieces too so if we could step on from there because uh, there are actually a number of different domains uh, which we'll, we'll look at in, in a little bit more detail in just a second but a uh, variety of different pathways to responsible computing uh, We've talked about sustainability. Sustainability is, is a vital part to it. It's an important, uh, very, very high profile element that, uh, that's Petra, as Petra talks about, we see customers asking us about a day on a, a very regular basis now. It's not always been the case, but it's increasingly important. Uh, other elements also, also exist. So we have inclusion and privacy, diversity, uh, circularity, climate, openness and ethics are all part of this. And this can be from an organisational point of view, or it can be from a sponsor's perspective as well. Uh, so it can be a, a important for a variety of ways. And in each of these different areas, we've suggested methods by which you might be able to measure where you are today, uh, be able to get cancer or KPIs or key performance object indicators, how you're doing today, and also be able to therefore demonstrate uh, if, if you are improving and uh, how you can actually make things better as well. And there we so just, we can step on to look. Sorry for Go interruption. Ahead. I mean, this is really a shift. I, I, I'm seeing that. As mentioned, for the last 18 months, we get more and more sustainability questions and requests. And I mean, IBM for a long time reports those. But the last couple of months, the other areas in terms of responsibility um, increased quite a bit. So a couple of weeks ago, I got a request from a customer team uh, that the customer wants basically proof and a formal letter that we don't exploit children in our production uh, line, right? So uh, no no child labor. And um, obviously we were able to, to provide that, but it took me quite a couple of days to find the right people in IBM that could write up that letter. So what I expect is that this will be published more broadly moving forward, not only kind of KPIs, David, to your point in the sustainability area, but more of these uh, in kind of the other speed, ethics, um, diversity, privacy, and so forth. And after all, I've been very careful to make sure that my children are happy to be in any videos or material that I've been producing. And I've been... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I asked them nicely. So, yes, exactly. Uh, so if we could step on to the next page, if that's all right. And so just to, to finish off, as I say, I've been focused very much on, on infrastructure. It's the easiest piece for, for, for me to look at. It's the, the area that I am I'm looking at. And I think actually there is a nice strong message in, in the infrastructure, which may not be immediately obvious uh, that uh, as our servers get more energy efficient, Efficient, and as they continue to be so very large and, and capable of running multiple workloads, we're actually in very much agreement with, with our, our cloud competitors, uh, saying how you can lower the energy and be more responsible for infrastructure. But there are a number of other domains. So you can see uh, there are, are six total domains to, to being a responsible computing provider. Uh, you can look at the kind of technology areas, which include the data centers. Uh, so actually, of course, the, the cloud providers have got some very efficient data centers. But I know a number of the partners I work with have been creating data data centers that are very energy efficient as well. And we talked a bit about responsible code. Then there's the areas which are maybe more about uh, the kind of uh, areas of societal aspects. Uh, so you have uh, the responsible systems and what this is about, uh, we'll talk to in just a second, but maybe overall trust about the whole thing, whole element, including people and anything else that's involved to deliver a service needs to be something you can trust and, and feel confident in. Uh, responsible data usage and also responsible impact are all different areas, uh, all across different kinds of areas we talk about uh, core industries we're making sure this is industry relevant and so we can access uh, different information about this and as we move forward this initiative more and more information will be coming out from ourselves and others so you can find out more about it uh, but just to finish off to look at these different domains with a, a, a quick and high level 
thank you, exactly, yes. And so we looked at the, the fact that if you look at the, the infrastructure, the key simplest messages are use current infrastructure components, consolidate your workloads together, so that means you can run at high levels of utilization. That's true for compute, it's true for storage, it's true for any element of the infrastructure. And also a, a, a side product, we know of course that IBM infrastructure across the board is very, very reliable. And if it's very, very reliable, then you don't have to replace the components as often. And that means, of course, that you actually have less waste, and that's good for the environment and responsible computing infrastructure overall. And if you can move on to the next domain, then we can look at the data centers. Uh, you can look at energy consumption. You can look, as Petra's taken us through, how to look at the carbon footprint, you can consider you know, the location of your data centers uh, as you're looking at. And of course, you can also, and there's a link behind this, uh, use and reuse materials. Uh, uh, you consider the use of materials you're using and also how you might be able to reuse them uh, in, the, in your data center to be as responsible about how you actually run that as, as possible. And then we can move on to the code. Uh, so the, the code piece, as we talked about, be aware of the impact and energy of the te technology used. Uh, so it depends what you're using. Different languages can actually have an impact here. So you can consider the different areas you weren't working with. Consider the accessibility of the code you're working with and also the energy consumption and sustainability of it. If it goes around in many, many loops in a wasteful sort of way, you're wasting compute time and that after is not necessarily responsible. And so then you can, once you've looked at it, once you consider these different areas, you can be an, an influencer about those choices made. Then we move on from the technology side to maybe the more societal piece, and you can look at the impact, look at what the UN is talking about and will be talking about here in Glasgow in coming days and weeks, uh, look at the uh, impact about the likability of what you're doing, uh, about setting goals, how it can be scaled, uh, see how it's measurable as well, just so you can see how you're responding there in an appropriate way, and be socially responsible. And then we got the usage. Uh, so the usage here is, is maybe, uh, I've seen this most recently actually when I was looking at the AI kind of world, uh, but to making sure that you're actually working with trusted and certified and high quality data, uh, avoiding misrepresentation of that data, making sure also that you have a risk assessment and mitigation for how you're using it. GDPR is one element to this obviously, and other elements too. And then you need to consider how you are retaining it and of course how you destroy it to make sure that it actually goes in the way you need it to do and people can't recover it in a way that would be undesirable. And to the last domain, then we have the responsible systems. And so systems overall need to be the sorts of things that actually allow trust across the entire range about how you govern it, how you actually, how the culture is behind these things, how people using it can, can be confident in these elements. And so there's a number of these different areas, each one of which has, has one pager, and each one of which actually has quite a lot more detail behind it as well. And so overall, this is how we, we, we IBM think you can be a responsible computing provider and provide trust back into that computing provider. And so I think if I remember our order correctly to finish off, um, we have just a couple of calls to action. Yes, yeah, so with the, with the corporate responsibility pledge we talked about, uh, so IBM pursues the highest standards of corporate responsibility in all we do, supporting and empowering employees and working with clients and suppliers and providing uh, governing our, our company. And that, you know, as Petra and I have said, is one of the reasons we like working for IBM is that actually this kind of area, uh, this sustainability message is something we can bring our whole selves to work about and talk about uh, with, with our hands and our hearts and be honest about what we're seeing because actually we can see good things happening and make sure we're telling and those with you. Petra, anything else you wanted to say to that? No, I agree with that. I mean, that goes back to my opening comment, right? That it's about leveraging, or I mean, in the first place, providing um, infrastructure to do good things. Uh, I mean, to, well, I mean, it, it's multifold. I mean, we covered sustainability and handling resources uh in a in a sustainable way but then as well right if you look at healthcare or other things i mean that's all under the responsibility pillar i think um if we look at diseases kind of um identifying them earlier uh so you can basically cure them or finding vaccines more quickly or other areas i mean there's so much under this umbrella uh what makes me passionate to work for idea yeah good point and so we chose to sort of finish up with calls to action, which happen to align to our six different domains. Uh, with, with Petra and I's kind of day job, you will be unsurprised to hear that we start with the infrastructure elements. And uh, so use current infrastructure, uh, consider the, the upgrading to Power 10 
well, it's easy, right? But it is actually something we think is a very sustainable message is if you upgrade, particularly if you're working with older boxes, you know, going all the way back to your power sevens, power eights, we can uh, really, you know, eat those up. We can we can swallow those up into into the, uh, the power 10 boxes and be able to do more with less, be much more sustainable with the energy utilization and actually save you money moving forward as well. Uh, and the E1080s being so scalable, I uh, can run at much higher levels of utilization than public clouds are, are likely to be able to achieve. And therefore through that, we can deliver sustainable uh, energy energy efficiency. We can also, of course, if you're looking at your, I mean, your own data centers, IBM provides consulting and design, construction and management services for those data centers if you want to. We know, of course, we also have uh, business partners who are looking at the same, same areas. So one uh, method of addressing that call to action could just be considering the data centers into which you put your servers as you move forward, which can be, uh, be more sustainable or less, depending on what's been done to them. We talked about code, and so you can use a maturity assessment from IBM. There are other methods, of course, as well, but the one option for you is to use maturity assessment tools and KPIs from IBM to be able to see what you're doing today, uh, be able to measure what the, the sort of project you're working with and analyze where you are, and then that might be able to give you a key areas you can actually focus on to be able to move that forward and make improvements in the code you're using. Uh, that could, of course, be code you're making, or indeed code that you're getting from, from providers as well. Uh, then once we move off the, the actual sort of technical side into more of the societal side, we also have frameworks uh, developed as part of these Academy of Technology studies, which can allow you to uh, an approach to assess uh, the data that's being used, um, actually how that's working, be a collaborative effort between business and IT to be able to make sure you can actually have a sustainable uh, and responsible use of your data and be able to show how that is being done. Yeah, and uh, that's very just part one, one two. comment from mine on this data usage right there. This is where things like, I mean, a couple of years ago, we introduced this AI Fairness 360, yes. right? That did exactly that, right? Check on if the data is kind of biased, um, how you can identify if someone tried to insert kind of um, uh, data sets that shouldn't be in there to make a certain decision or things like that. So there's a lot of things that go into these different areas and are worth uh, a look at yeah Absolutely right. And of course, as we as we maybe look at running AI more directly inside of our Power 10 boxes, it could be directly relatable to Power 10 again as well. Uh, so uh, systems uh, demand uh, that your systems are fair, ethical, and do not cause bias or harm to people in the environment. Uh, as the overall systems, that's not just server systems. This is the systems of, of things that are done by businesses. And it seems a fair demand to me. Uh, and responsible computing impact. Again, IBM does have uh, six primary measurable maturity characteristics, and we can provide a good representation of the program or project's capability to achieve responsible impact. There are other ways as well, uh, but these are maybe calls to action that you might consider. Uh, I think at that point, uh, we might look to see, are there, are there any questions? Uh, happy to take those now if you want. I no, just... Go ahead, Judy, sorry. I was just going to say um, that I don't see any outstanding um, questions in the chat window, um, but if participants do have any, please enter them into the chat window. And so maybe the, while we wait for question, Yorty, um, I just um, play found the video. An error in my link, so I could just play the video like this for the sixty seconds, and sure. while it plays, we can see if there are additional question comments um, coming in. Yep, sounds good. All right. <laughs> So even though it was very short, I hope you saw that uh, the power tension was even part of this short video. So I, I thought it had a very good summary of the high level points we talked about earlier, uh, what IBM basically voluntarily agreed on and uh, that power 10 is part of that story. And when looking at the environmental report of these years, right, you will 
find certain sections that are in particular on IBM systems and power systems uh, uh, in, in particular. Thank you, Petra. I just wanted to say thanks to Petra and David for taking us through not only the sort of specifics about the individual power systems, power servers, um, but also um, showing us how, you know, manufacturing, packing, shipping, all of those elements are being considered before the servers even get to our client site. Um, and there's a, a lot of useful information in, in that uh, presentation and, and the webinar that you've just heard. So thank you very much. Um, if there are any follow-on questions, I'll be sure to find both of you. Um, I, you know I'm not shy at um, <laughs> contacting people, so um, I, I will yeah, come back. That's a, that sounds good. And I mean, in addition, right, I mean, David and I both try to be active on social media. So as soon as the PCF for the E1080 um, is, is being published, I'll definitely put something out there. So for those of you who are waiting for it, um, you might catch it there as well. Sure, and we'll be sure to publicize that. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment about the session coming up next month on PowerVac. Um, it is on the 17th of November, the same time as today, uh, although we finish British summer time, so it's GMT next month, um, 2 p.m. GMT. And we've got Harry and Pete Herman. Um, our speakers next month and basically they're going to cover power vm features in the power 10 systems as well as hmc version 10 enhancements the cmc uh, which is the cloud management console and enterprise pools all the enhancements that are in those elements so i do hope that everyone can join us uh, for that session next month um, i will be sending out details of uh, this next session at the same time as I send out de details of the replay from today's session. Hope to have it with you in a few hours. Um, uh, so let me see if uh, Webex is going to play ball and release the recording um, very soon. So thank you all so much for joining. My thanks again to Petra and David. Thank you all to all our subscribers and our participants for their time. Thanks for having us, Yoti. Have a great rest of the day, all of you. Thank you. Stop the recording.